Welcome everybody, good evening, and uh, thank you for joining us for the August 2020 novice meeting tonight. Um, have a, a pretty exciting presentation uh, stored in store for us here. Uh, I know Debbie has uh, had a lot of requests for these types of talks recently, so we're really excited to uh, have this presentation here. And as some of you may have heard earlier, we're trying to get the schedule for the upcoming months uh, sorted out as well. So we've got some other great novice talks upcoming. So uh, without further ado, I'll go ahead and introduce uh, Debbie. And I've said it before, she really <laughs> needs no introduction here at the club. But um, well, yeah, I was gonna say, Debbie has had a lifelong interest in astronomy since her childhood in Midland, Texas, where all the scenery is in the sky. So <laughs> I don't, do they still have much sky there, Debbie? Or I, I understand, I haven't been there a long time. I understand it's at least double the size it was. So I doubt is it as it was when I was a kid there in the 60s. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you've been a longtime member of the Houston Astronomical Society, and you've served in a number of capacities here. And currently, you're the novice chairperson in charge of programs for new members. Uh, she also participates in outreach programs and is a volunteer telescope operator at the George Observatory in Brazos Penn State Park. Uh, that is currently closed, but when that <laughs> opens again, I'm sure uh, you'll continue with those outreach efforts, as, as many of us do. Uh, she's also the 2017 recipient of the International Dark Sky Association's Hogue Robinson Award for Education of Government Officials about Outdoor Lighting Issues. So a uh, really big uh, honor there for, for Debbie and, and, and really indicative of all the work that she's done here in Houston and other uh, places as well. Uh, in 2010, her Woodside neighborhood became the first one within the Houston city limits allowed to install low glare, fully shielded decorative streetlights. And for the past four years, she's presented concerns about the choice of high glare, white LED streetlights in Houston to city officials in hopes that the Houston area will someday join other communities in moving to warm or soft white or to amber LEDs, which are recommended by the American Medical Association for the reduced glare and reduced restriction to day-night circadian function. It's also recommended, I believe, Debbie, by uh, other groups such as the Audubon Society and, and um, other groups like that as well for, uh, for migratory purposes of birds and things like that. Is that correct? Yes. Ah, okay. So um, Debbie's got her presentation here about uh, all of the gems in the August night sky. We're really looking forward to it. I would ask uh, if you're on Zoom, you have a chat function down at the bottom there. If you have questions, please feel free to post your questions in there and we'll get to those uh, at the end of the, the presentation here. So and Don Adams said he graduated from Midland Lee in 1965. Yes. So yeah, there you go. <laughs> Where I would have gone to school. I was at Alamo and then I moved to Houston, Alamo Junior High. So uh, without further ado, I'll pass it over to you, Debbie. Okay, thank you. So uh, first of all, all novice chairs need introductions because hopefully some of you at least are relevant. <laughs> Good to the point. Club. That's what we're here for. And the, the um, sort of the programs that we do are a combination of true um, novice programs, maybe for people who haven't done astronomy before. And, but you'll also find that sometimes we do some programs that are a new pursuit, maybe even for more experienced astronomers. And we've had a bit of a string of those. So I thought it was time to get back to a, a basic sky identification and how to, how to learn a little bit, how to find your way about the, around the sky tonight. And I just want to mention now, and probably at the beginning of all the novice meetings, that when you're a new member, there are a lot of things you need to know pretty fast. And at this point, we have a lot of recorded presentations. So if you have a question about telescopes or how to, call, how to uh, use your telescope or what collimation is or what all the astronomy terms are, or all the other seasonal sky talks. Many of them are now recorded and you can go onto our website, which is at astronomyhouston.org, log in, and then on the right, you'll see a little box with recorded, and you can click on recorded HAS presentations. And not only the main meeting presentations are there, but several years of novice meetings are there. And you can just find the topic that you need to know about. So for instance, we're gonna mention Jupiter tonight, but we won't have time to go into detail, but there's an entire Jupiter talk that tells you everything you need to know about Jupiter, all sorts of details. Um, so let me go ahead and get to my talk, see if I can open it. And I'm calling it Gems of the August Sky. And I am, am I slight, sorry, did I remember to press uh, screen share or not? Don't see it right now, Debbie. Okay, I think I just went to it without doing share screen. Let me do that first. Um, there it is, okay. All right, there it's we go. It's coming up, there we go. Okay, let me start the slideshow. Okay, everybody see that okay? We do, yes. Okay, all right. So um, 
this is kind of a prelude almost to the to autumn, the August. We're about to lose the summer sky and starting into the fall sky. So it'll be a little bit of a hybrid of both. Um, first of all, I just like to have a start out with a pretty picture of going out under the stars, um, which I recommend that people do with their naked eye first when they're new astronomers and just get to know the, the constellations um, and, and just the, all the star patterns. So to those of you who are new, we are the Houston Astronomical Society. That's our website there, astronomyhouston.org. And we have an observing site near Columbus, Texas. And hopefully next month, Joe Caleb will uh, give you a lot more details about that observing site. Um, so even if you have these, in this day and age, you don't need to know how to read maps to drive a car because you've got your GPS. The same thing with the sky. We have all sorts of technology. You can point a phone at the sky and it'll tell you exactly what you're looking at. Or you can buy a telescope, which, which will, you just tell it what you want to look at and it'll just zoom over there. Um, it's still really nice to be able to look at the sky and instead of seeing random stars, um, to see a real picture book up there. So um, there's a number of, of, um, of sky atlases that are very simple, meaning that they don't go too deep into the sky as far as what magnitudes of stars, that's the brightness of the stars that you can see. So they're really good for learning uh, constellations, learning naked eye objects, and some of the brighter things you can see in binoculars or in a small telescope. So one of the best is the Pocket Sky Atlas put out by Sky and Telescope magazine. Um, there's Will Tyrion's Bright Star Atlas, and there's an Edmund Mag 5 Star Atlas. So all of these are atlases that you don't necessarily use with giant telescopes. You use with your naked eye or very small telescopes or binoculars. Um, what I first recommend is that people learn the constellations. And I remember when I was a kid, that was very hard to do. There were, all, there were maps that looked like this, or there were strange um, dot to dots that didn't look anything like the star patterns. And it was very difficult. Then came along H.A. Ray, who's a children's book author, who wrote the book Find the Constellations. And he made it a lot easier. So I used this book when I was about 12 years old. And he teaches you a few constellations at the time, and I'll show you the inside in a bit. Um, he's the same person who wrote the Curious George books, H.A. Ray with an R-E-Y. Um, but he, pre he created stick figures for the constellations. So you, people used to not do very easy to find stick figures. They didn't look like the figure they were supposed to be. So he drew his own lines, his own dot to dots, and many of those are still the patterns I see today when I look in the sky. So um, Virgo used to look kind of cryptic. Now she looks like a kind of middle-aged woman lying on her side. Um, but Otes, who's a herdsman, he drew as a guy sitting down with a pipe in his mouth and a, and a little triangle hat and, and so on. Now he also has a companion book called Stars of which Find the Constellations is a subset. These books are written for children, so they are appropriate for children to learn the stars, but they, I also find that I recommend them for adults just because they make um, seeing the sky so much easier. The, this is another one of my favorite basic books, Exploring the Night Sky by Terence Dickinson, which is just sort of an overview of astronomy. So he's got a section, it's a little thin paperback, he's got a section on the planets, he has a section on some of the constellations. Um, <laughs> okay. Okay, and I'm getting a little noise from somebody's microphone. I, I went um, ahead and muted that. Okay, and um, uh, another way you can learn the sky is with the planisphere. I was asked about uh, planisphere in a question. Let me go back to that. And um, what this does, it has a window here, and behind this front panel is actually the entire sky that you would ever see all year round. You must get a planisphere for your basic latitude. So this one says latitude 30 degrees north. This one's made exactly for Houston's latitude, but anywhere from 30 to 40 would be fine. And the way you use it, you will see times of day around the inner circle. And then you have dates over here. So let's say you go out at 9 p.m. tonight, you would find, um, and this may be for standard times. So you may have to adjust it for daylight saving time. You'll have to make your own adjustment on the simplest plan spheres. So let's say you go out at 9 p.m. tonight. Um, that's daylight saving time, so you may have to use the 8 p.m. Uh, marking, and you would uh, put that time opposite the date. So you would put the 8 p.m. opposite August 6th, 
this window would then move and the stars would be the ones that you're seeing at that time of night. So this is great for any time of night, 3 a.m., 4 a.m., uh, whenever you want to observe. Midnight, it will always show you the stars you need to see. And anything, any simple map like this, though you do need to know that the center of that map is all the stars overhead, and you need to turn the map so that you only use the bottom half of it and, and, you, and you see the stars right side up in the direction that you're facing. If you try to look at the stars on the other side of you with the map upside down, everything's gonna to be topsy-turvy. I'll show you that a little bit better when we get to the map I'd like to use tonight. Also, the two major magazines, Astronomy and Sky and Telescope, have a monthly sky map, which is good for early evening for that month. Um, but my favorite way to get a sky map is skymaps.com, www.skymaps.com with the S. And um, if you print out a map that, I don't know if any people you can see me, it looks like this. Um, but you, on the front homepage, you'll see a picture of the map. Underneath of that are the words, download the latest issue, not the last issue, but the latest issue. And um, then you get to another page, you scroll down, there'll be a whole list of maps, and the top one will be that today's month, August, and Northern Edition. So I have a pen pal right now in Uganda. They also had equatorial maps. They're right on the equator. And he became interested in looking at the sky when I showed him that he could download these free maps for Uganda in the, in, for the equatorial version. So this is what this month's map looks like. Um, this is just a screenshot I took today. And um, one thing I want you to notice is the, the direct, oh, I have a very sensitive mouse, is the directions around the edges. Notice that north is written upside down here, south is down here, southwest, west, northwest, northeast, east, um, southeast. So first notice those. Uh, notice on the left, you have some information about interesting naked eye things to see that particular month. There is a second page, which I don't have a picture of, on the back, which tells you more about the objects you can see in, in tele, small telescopes, binoculars, and naked eye, and which ones you can see from the map. So the map has a lot of little fuzzy spots, little symbols marked with little um, uh, identifications, like um, uh, IC4666. All of these are things that you might be able to see as a fuzzy spot in binoculars or as something interesting in a telescope. So the brightest objects are marked on this map and the constellations. The constellations also have very good kind of dot to dot, making them very easy to see. So Hercules is actually a man here and um, uh, Pegasus is actually a flying horse. We'll talk about him later, but he's known for the great square of Pegasus over here. Now, when I learned constellations, I started out with a very easy one. Uh, the Big Dipper is actually a piece of a constellation and then branched out. When I learned more of the sky, I grouped the constellations together into pieces of the sky. So tonight I'm gonna to talk about several pieces. We'll talk about the circumpolar constellations. Those are the ones that go around the, the, north, the pole star here, Polaris, and they circle that star and they never set. They get close to the trees, but they never set at our latitude. So that's this area of the map. Um, we also have the summer triangle and they actually have a triangle drawn here. That centers on these three constellations here, Lyra, Aquila, and Cygnus, and we'll talk about those in detail. Um, we're starting to lose some of the Southern Milky Way constellations, but we still have Sagittarius and Scorpius, and above that, Ophiuchus. So I see this part of the sky is in a group. Um, Hercules and Boötes are overhead. Um, for me, I will show you how I use Ophiuchus and, Bo and Hercules to find each other. And, and then we have a whole mythological story in this area of the sky in the Northeast, which will be coming higher and higher in the sky as we go along in the fall. So we have the whole story of Andromeda and Perseus um, and, and all the characters are in this part of the sky. And then the last set of constellations are the ones, the familiar horoscope constellations, or the ones on the ecliptic, Aquarius, Capricorn, Sagittarius, Scorpius, Libra, Virgo. These, this dotted line here is the path that the planets and the sun appear to take in the sky because of line of sight. And I will explain that a little bit later. Um, the, the, the first thing you'll notice about this map is that it's odd because west is on the right side, east is on the left, and that's very different from a terrestrial map, um, which I just mentioned this slide. So why is that? And that's because this is a map 
looking overhead. So if any of you print out that map, if you were to take the map you printed out, hold it over your head, put the words north toward the north, then the east will actually be on your right side if you hold that map over your head. So that's why it appears backwards. Now this is true whether you have a map of the entire sky or a very detailed map where you might only be looking at a tiny piece of sky, west will always be on the right side of that map. Um, but when you're out under the sky, um, if you want to find west, uh, it's in the direction you expect it to be um, from the Earth. Now, after you learn constellations, binoculars are a great next step. They're sort of prerequisite to using a telescope. And there are some observing programs that the Astronomical League offers, which, will, which you can find things in binoculars and write them down, and they will give you a, a pen for that. And I remember accident, my parents gave me binoculars when I was at music school in upstate New York for the first time. And I remember discovering things, this is before I was a member of the club, like uh, the Lagoon and Triffid Nebulas, and just by sweeping the sky with binoculars. And I thought I just found this amazing thing. And it wasn't until years later I knew what I must have been looking at. But I was, we had a very dark sky and I just looked for anything fuzzy with binoculars. And again, those are marked on this map. Now, if you use binoculars for astronomy, you want a good wide field view and you want good brightness. So that means you want a fairly large ratio between the first number and the seven number. So at least binoculars, seven is the magnification and 50 is the aperture of each lens in millimeters. And so these would be good, um, good astronomical binoculars because there's a pretty large ratio between the two. You want a ratio of at least five. Uh, bird watching binoculars you could use. These are 10 by 32s, but they're a lot less satisfying. So you'll see a, a smaller, you'll see things magnified 10 times, but a much smaller piece of the sky, which makes things harder to see. And when you have the smaller ratio, there's also less brightness. So the larger ratio is going to give you more brightness. So you can often find just these basic binoculars at an estate sale for $10, and those are good to go. Um, then there are our basic star charts, terms that I want you to know, which have to do with how the sky is laid out. Um, and you will find these terms sometimes on a, a, a real sky atlas or map. The celestial north pole is, is a projection of the Earth's axis onto the sky. Same thing with the celestial south pole. We happen to have a star very close to the celestial north pole called Polaris, but that is a coincidence. There is no similar south star. The celestial equator is basically a projection of the Earth's equator onto the sky. <clears throat> There's a coordinate system, which I'll go into in a minute, called right ascension, which is sort of an equivalent of longitude lines on the Earth, and declination, which is something like an equivalent of latitude lines, which help you identify where an object is by their coordinates, coordinates and right ascension declination. And then there's the ecliptic, which is tilted at 23 degrees to the celestial equator because the Earth's axis is tilted relative to its orbit around the sun. So a little bit more about right ascension declination. Um, right ascension is measured. Sorry, uh, right ascension is measured in hours, hours, minutes, and seconds. Even though it works a lot like longitude lines. So each of these major lines are one hour apart, and there's 24 hours going all the way around. Um, declination is more familiar. It's in degrees, minutes, and seconds. So zero degrees is at the equator and 90 degrees is at the North Celestial Pole, not directly above you, but the North Celestial Pole, so at Polaris. And then it goes in the negative numbers going toward the South Celestial Pole. Now, right ascension is measured in hours, minutes, and seconds because not only is it a distance in the sky, but it's based on a time. So it takes a star one hour of time to move one hour in right ascension across the sky. As, as the star moves, um, it, it's, it has its coordinate, but it's, it changes position by one, one hour of right ascension and one hour. Now, this is a 24-hour clock. It's not based on the same clock that our diurnal clock is. And that, the reason that is is that our time to face the sun every day is 24 hours, but while we're, make, while we're revolving and facing the sun again the next day, we have also moved along our, our, or, our orbit just a little bit. So to face the sun again, we have to turn once plus a little bit of extra every day, and that's the 24 hours. 
but the stars are so far off and the sidereal day is based on facing the same star again that it's based, it is a one complete revolution of the earth and then stop. That is about four minutes shorter. So about 23 hours and 56 minutes. So when we talk about one hour of right ascension, it is based on one uh, 23 hour and 56 minute day, not a 24 hour day. So there are clocks actually in observatories which have um, your current time at where, you're, where you are based on earth. And then they have a sidereal clock and then they have universal time, which I hope Bill Spitzeri will mention in his October uh, talk because he's going to talk about Greenwich Observatory uh, on which universal time is based. But very briefly, universal time is a time in Greenwich, uh, it's called also Greenwich Mean Times, a time in Greenwich, England. And many uh, events in astronomy are expressed only in universal time because presumably people all over the world are going to watch them. So by express telling people when it happens in universal time, they can correct for their own time zone. So for instance, in uh, Houston, we are six hours earlier than universal time at, on st at standard time, and we are five hours at daylight saving time. There's also, an, just an aside, there's a, a website called timeanddate.com, and this is really great when you're planning or observing for Will the moon be in my way? So they've got sunrise and sunset times for Houston, moonrise and moonset times for Houston. And anytime there's something transient, like an eclipse, a lunar eclipse, a solar eclipse, they will have animations of how those things appear in your sky. So you can do for Houston, Texas, how a specific, um, how a specific lunar eclipse will appear and they'll do a little animation of it. So it's great for that kind of information, timeanddate.com. Um, now I'm going to go back. This is just a, a help you conceptualize why the ecliptic appears as it does. So here's the sun, here's the earth, here's the sun. The earth moves this way, but it's tilted. So um, what, what the ecliptic is, is the apparent line of sight would be this red line of the, of the sun and all the planets um, as seen from the earth. So that the ecliptic is tilted 23 degrees because our axis is tilted 23 degrees from the celestial and the Earth's equator. But that's what, when you're looking for Saturn or Jupiter or Mars, they'll always be in this set of constellations, which is along, along this ecliptic. They can't go to a completely different part of the sky. Now, one thing that helps you visualize the sky is I like to start people on imagining themselves on the North Pole. And if you're on the North Pole, um, you're standing right on top of the Earth's axis and all the stars would appear to go, it's like you're on a merry-go-round. All the stars are your parents going around you um, and the North Star would be directly overhead. The problem is that in Houston, we are two thirds of the way down the globe. So everything's tilted. Um, if you were to say, say take a telescope on the North Pole, all you'd have to, and you wanted to follow a star, you just put a turntable on the ground with a mo and, and with a motor that moves at exactly the same speed as the stars. When we're down, over down here in Houston, there are some telescopes that effectively tilt that turntable to match. Um, so that the turntable thinks it's on at the North Pole, um, and then it still follows the stars. We now have computers which do more complicated motions, and so many telescopes don't have that anymore. But, um, but you will see the stars rise in the east, set in the west, and then there'll be a few stars very close to Polaris. The ones that will only go down this far, they'll never set. They'll get low or they'll get high, but they'll never go below the horizon. So this is what that looks like. This is, a, uh, this is what we call a star trail shot. All you have to do is take a, a, a tripod, set a camera up that has a bulb setting, uh, run it for about 10 minutes and stop, and this is what you're going to see. So here's the North Star here. Um, the stars are rising in the east. Whoops, sorry, I forget about my mouse here. Rising in the east, setting in the west. And if you can see, if they're, if they're close enough to the North Star, they, never, they actually never set. They just go around in a circle. Anything farther does go below the horizon. Um, so the North Star, to find it, the best thing is to find the very famous, not constellation, but asterism, the Big Dipper. This is actually part of a larger constellation called the Great Bear. And even in Houston, with our light polluted skies, you can see it. And it's very easy to identify because it really does look like a pot on the sky. It's got four stars that 
that, that, the, that are bowl, and it's got a handle, and there's a crook in the handle, and notice the spin, because that's an important thing you can look at with binoculars. And once you identify this Big Dipper shape, this pot with a handle shape, no matter how it's oriented, upside down, sideways, find the front, bottom front of the pot, then go to the top front of the pot, and then go about five times that distance. And the only thing that's even reasonably bright will be Polaris, the North Star. If you face that star, you know that you're facing north. So that's uh, number one. And now you'll know where east, west, and south are in the sky. This just shows how um, the different orientations of the Big Dipper at different times of, of the at different seasons. This would be for early evening. So, um, so it will be high up in the spring, upside down, and autumn it starts to get lower, summer, summer it's sideways, etc. Um, and, and actually, if you stay up late at night, you'll see it go halfway around this circle. You just need to be able to identify it in any orientation. So here are the circumpolar stars. Um, the stars are now black. Here's the, again the Big Dipper. And again, you take the star, this star, even if it's upside down, you find Polaris. Another prominent uh, circumpolar constellation is Cassiopeia, which is very easy to see. It looks like an M or a W, and it can also be seen in a light fluted sky. So that's my secondary way of finding the Polaris. If the Big Dipper is way down the horizon of house or trees are covering it, that means Cassiopeia will be high and it's open ends, so the open end of the W or the open end of the M will be pointing toward Polaris. And it's also about the same distance. Now, as it turns out, a light polluted sky, uh, Polaris is about almost, it stands out all by itself. There's not a lot of clutter over there, so it's very easy to identify. Um, now, it just happens to be luck that we have a North Star. Um, we won't always have a North Star because not only does the Earth spin on its axis, but like a top, it also, it also pre what we call precesses. It has a wobble in it. This is a very slow wobble. It takes about 26,000 years to go around once. But we happen to be living, fortunately, at a time where there's a reasonably bright star above our North Axis. There's going to be a long desert for thousands of years before we get to some other bright stars. And in 13,000 years, one of the brightest stars in the sky will be the North Star of Vega. But just know that what we see now is not a permanent situation. In addition to that, there's a little wiggle so, um, in our, in our uh, axis called nutation. What all this means is that every 50 years or so, the atlases have to change. Our whole coordinate system uh, shifts position relative to the stars. So when I started out, I first used this Norton star atlas, which was for epoch 1950. And that means that it was good from about 1925 to 1975 or so. And then a new one came out in the year 2000 with a new coordinate system. Now I'm hearing that with the, in the advent of computers and computerized atlases, this is starting to happen real time. And um, we may be getting away from the printed books that come out every 50 years. Um, and people are get, relying more and more on computerized atlases that keep up with this precession. Um, another thing that's handy to know, um, like for instance, when we go out to see the International Space Station tonight is, how, how, what are the distances in the sky? So if someone says that Jupiter is gonna be 20 degrees above the south horizon, um, and you're wondering, is it above that tree or below that tree? You can use your arm at, at uh, you can use your hand at arm's length. This is for most people's proportion, works for just about everybody. Uh, a fist is 10 degrees, a like UT hook and horns here is 15 degrees. So from here to here, is 15 degrees of sky, um, three fingers is five. Well, I use most frequently the, the 10 degrees and the 15 degrees. Great for wondering what, whether you're gonna see something above the horizon or often the International Space Station, they say, well, you won't see it till it's 25 degrees up and it emerges from the Earth's shadow. Now you'll know what, where that 25 degrees is above the horizon. Okay, back now to the constellations. We're starting with the Big Dipper, which is a great way to, um, find two other constellations by using it. We've already found the North Star. We can also use its handle, which, which describes a curve. And the very next bright star you run into is Arcturus. We say we arc to Arcturus. And we have only a short time to keep going on to Spica. So spike the Spica or speed on the Spica. Um, so again, you can take a very familiar constellation and find something else easily. 
So Arcturus is the brightest star. It's a bright orangish red star in the constellation of Otes, um, which looks kind of like a elongated five-pointed kite shape. Um, and this is that's a very nice globular cluster. I'm not going to show you that because I'm going to show you other globulars over here called M3. But it has a, a few nice objects to look at in it. But it's also a very easy shape to see in the sky. Um, if you look at a lot of my maps, they're going to have all these M's. M3, which I just mentioned, M53, M51. What does the M mean? M is for Charles Messier, who lived from 1730 to 1817. He was a French uh, astronomer who was trying to find comets and he was trying to which is basically a fuzzy spot we just had comet neowise which when you look at it night after night moves with respect to the stars but there's a lot of other fuzzy things up there especially when people had less good telescopes um, which could have possibly be mistaken for comets so he he discovered a lot of other objects and they're among some of the best to look at um, called the messier objects and he wrote them down and cataloged them so he could, while he was uh, looking for comets, and that's called the Messier list. There's 110 of them. And those are largely what's marked on the map that we printed out. Um, now let's move on to the summer triangle. This is called the summer triangle because it's up all night in the summer, meaning earlier in the summer, it rises at dusk, it's overhead at midnight and it sets at dawn. But it's actually most prominent in the autumn when it starts out very high in the sky in the early evening. It's one of the first things you'll notice. The summer triangle, and I'll show you a picture of it drawn as a triangle, are, is not one constellation, but the brightest stars in three different constellations. But they describe, they're so bright, they really stand out. They describe a very prominent triangle in the, in the sky. So we have Deneb in the constellation Cygnus the Swan, which the inner part of Cygnus looks like a cross, also known as the Northern Cross. Vega in the very geometric looking constellation in Lyra the Lyre. Um, and then we've got Altair, which is a tail of, which is, or actually it's the eye of Aquila the Eagle. However, since some of us are pilots, I keep seeing a Delta winged airplane every time I look at this and I see this is the head and that's the tail. But it's an eagle sitting on a, with his uh, wings outstretched. Um, so again, with just a triangle, you can find three constellations right there. So here they are in the sky, and this is uh, lower in the summer, but tonight they will be a lot higher up when we go outside. Um, one of the prominent stars, oh, let me just mention how, so now we have a star version. Deneb is a swan, so you can think of him as a very long neck here with a head here. Uh, there's a wings, you can see the inner part of the wings very easily as part of the Northern Cross, but if you keep going in a dark sky, there's beautiful wing tips here, and then a little connection here of a chain of stars, and there's a wingtip here. Cygnus of Swan is one of my favorite constellations. If you really see the whole constellation, it looks very much like a swan. Um, the other thing about Cygnus is it's flying directly between the other two stars in this triangle. Um, Vega is a bright blue-white star, hard to miss, and it's part of a little geometric constellation, a little tiny equilateral triangle attached to, attached to a parallelogram. Very striking how regular these little shapes are. Altair is, the, is part of, again, the eagle. And a lot of this constellation here, here's the, one of the wings here. It's kind of sideways in this. But you will see the whole thing up in the, since we're now later in the season. OK, so I was going to mention that this is one of the most beautiful double stars in the sky. And it's called Albirio. And it's a beautiful gold star next to blue star. So double stars are a wonderful way to see colors in the sky because the color contrast is very easy to see when the stars are close to each other. To show you where Albirio is, it is this star, the head of Cygnus the Swan, which is barely discernible in Houston's light polluted skies. I can just make it out. It'll be the only star you can see between Vega and Altair and just inside this line. Um, but in a dark sky, it's very easy to see. But this is a very easy object to see in the city. Um, there are also two of the best planetary nebulae. These are exploding, um, these are stars the size of the sun, which are toward the end of their life. They've gone through a red giant stage. They've burned up a lot of their fuel and they've started to expel their outer layers. Um, so the ring nebula, this is more of the, the large, the major telescope version. It actually looks like a little Cheerio in the sky, a hazy Cheerio. And the Dumbbell Nebula are two of my favorites. 
Um, so to find the ring nebula, it's a very easy one to find. You go to this little geometric constellation with a triangle. Um, again, attached to one end of the triangle is a parallelogram. You want the two close stars on the far end of the parallelogram, the farthest end from the triangle. And it's not quite halfway, maybe about three-fifths, but if you point at most telescopes about halfway in there, you're, it's probably going to be in your field. And it's going to look like a wonderful little, um, little glowing ring in the sky. It's not real big, but fairly bright. Um, the other wonderful planetary nebula is called the Dumbbell Nebula, M27. And that's a little harder to find, but it's off of the swan here. Uh, there's a little constellation called Sagitta, the arrow. And I find it really kind of as a, tri as a certain size triangle. But you can, see, in a dark sky, you can easily see this little constellation and find it. It's actually in the constellation of Volpecula. Uh, but that's worth finding. I looked at it many times in a, in a five inch telescope. Um, now, off, another thing that you got, got, need a dark sky for, but you need to know about is the North American Nebula. This is a binocular object, not naked eye and not telescope. It's way too big for a telescope. And it's a little bit of a Where's Waldo effect to it. You can be looking straight at it, but have a little hard time making it out. You need to know, you need to find Deneb, and you need to know exactly how it's oriented. But what this is, is kind of a hazy patch, dense patch in the, in the Milky Way, that's shaped very much like, the nor like North America. So here it is in the sky. Uh, in your binoculars, you will see these dark patches, but you will not get this red color to help you out. It will be whitish. But there is Galveston right here. So um, you can find the Gulf of Mexico and Florida, and then find there's actually a star at Galveston. Uh, another wonderful object in, the, in Cygnus is called the Veil Nebula. And you do need a filter for this. But in any dark sky with something called a, a, um, a, a, nebula, a filter designed for nebulae, a, a, L, oh, am I blanking out? A, a light pollution reduction filter uh, that enhances the contrast in the, in the back of the sky, it's easy to find because one of the stars in Cygnus, not one of the most prominent ones, but there is a star you can aim at and you'll be looking at the Veil Nebula. In a large telescope, this is really striking. In a very dark sky, small telescope with a filter, you can still see it. And it's too big, and it will be, you'll have to, you'll see pieces of it. That is a, a supernova remnant from a very large star, which completely exploded um, many years ago. Um, now, directly overhead, we have Hercules, which I also think is a bit of a Where's Waldo constellation. And it's defined by what they call a keystone shape. It's got, he's a Hercules from the mythology. His head is here, he's got broad shoulders, he's upside down this picture, a ne nice narrow waist, a tunic, his is her, his knees. And, and uh, what you mostly, what you'll find most prominently are one, two, three, four, five, six in this kind of butterfly shape stars, plus the head making a big triangle. Most people find Hercules in its relationship to uh, Lyra the Lyre, which is very easy to see. It's kind of beside it. I have an oddball way of finding Hercules. Ophiuchus is very easy to see and has a giant triangle head. Hercules' um, triangle head is butted up against Ophiuchus's head. I don't know why, but that's always the way I find them. The stars are bright. They're just other stars equally bright around it. it makes it a little hard to see. Um, Hercules for sorry. Sorry about that. Hercules is known for M13, one of the best um, globular clusters in the northern sky. And that's very easy to find because, uh-oh, I just lost my, there we go. He's exactly one third, of, one, one third of the way from this star to this star. So as long as you can see these stars naked eye, aim binoculars or telescope exactly one third of the way from the knee to the waist, on um, this side, on the flatter side of the butterfly, you will find M13. So um, this is a photo by Jason Ware. A globular cluster is an artifact from the much older, or much earlier in our galaxy's history. And these are by and large, mostly very old stars. They're much more densely packed than where our neighborhood, which is in the spiral arms of the galaxy. And um, the stars are, so they're less than one light year apart. So if you lived on a planet in a globular cluster, you'd be kind of surrounded by Milky Way. The sky would be full, much more dense with stars than what we can see. 
Um, these tend to be very old objects. I think the origin is still unknown, but we do think they're associated maybe with the formation of the galaxy because they're, they tend to be about the, among the oldest stars associated with the galaxy. They also are not in the spiral arms. They are in a halo around the galaxy. So this is the plane of our galaxy where most of the stars circulate around the galactic center. The globular clusters are above and below that plane just dotting around. There's uh, something like 250, 270 of them. And uh, they're be all beautiful to look at. They look like snowballs made out of stars and usually so dense that you cannot uh, resolve them separately in the interior. The bigger a telescope you see have, the, more, the farther into the interior you can look into them. And they're beautiful. Um, Ophiuchus is a, is a large but not prominent constellation, um, which is in the south part of our sky right now but he's almost empty. So this shape is fairly easy to see. And this is actually the, um, the figure that Aeschylus, the, if you've pro probably seen for doctors have the serpent holder and the serpent winding around. This is that character from Greek mythology. Um, so he, there's another constellation here called Serpents that kind of runs along his edge and his lower edge and he's holding it. This is his head here. And he's kind of this big rectangle with a triangle up here. Um, and then with this kind of string of stars that makes serpents. And he's in the neighborhood of Sagittarius and Scorpius, just above them, which we will, in the southern sky, which we will discuss those later. He has a couple of also very good globular clusters, smaller, but very good to look at, M10 and M12, in, in the middle. Um, now we come to the most spectacular part of the sky, which we will lose soon. This is your last chance. And that is looking toward the center of our galaxy. Um, it's where the Milky Way broadens, and when you look over here, you're actually looking toward dead center, and it's very close to a constellation called Sagittarius. But it's more prominent part of Sagittarius is a top part, which looks exactly like a teapot. There's a triangle spout, there's a kind of trapezoidal body, uh, a, a, a lid, and a handle, and the Milky Way is the smoke is like the steam coming out of the teapot. Um, there's also a teaspoon over here, although it's not quite as bright. Um, from, uh, from, the, from the left hand corner up here to the lid to over here, about the same distance are some of the most spectacular things you look at in a telescope in the sky, the lagoon and the Trifid nebulas right here. Um, and you can't see them in the same field. This is a wide field photograph in your telescope. You have to look at them one at a time. Both of these are areas of star formation. The most prominent is called the Lagoon Nebula, and you actually have, these are making new stars, so you still have hydrogen gas. You can actually see some of the star cluster of, of new stars being formed in the Lagoon Nebula. And um, this is a little overexposed, but it actually kind of a very dark area here, which may look black in your telescope. That's what the Lagoon, this is not the Lagoon name, the name comes from the dark area here, which people thought looked like a Lagoon. So you see the star cluster and then this very hazy area kind of next to each other with black in between. The Trifid was named because of this section, which looks like there's this dark dust lanes going through it, which divided into three parts. And those are the ones I discovered in my binoculars at music camp. You can see both of them beautifully in binoculars. Now, once you've found the teapot in the southeast part of the sky, um, which you can go out tonight and see it, you will notice very prominently the, the planets, Jupiter and Saturn, right next to each other. And those are amazing to look at. So any, any telescope will get a good view of those. Um, what's gonna be happening in the next few months is they are gonna be dancing around each other and they're gonna become very close together in December. I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. So here's a, a Saturn's the, probably the more responsible than any other object for getting people to join astronomy clubs. And it's always beautiful to look at. Um, the details you can see are the gaps in the, the, the Cassini and the Enki divisions, the gaps in the rings. Um, it's not a lot of detail, but sometimes people have discovered storms on Saturn and it's tilt of its rings are gonna vary every time you look at it. So they go from very open to then they close. Then there's one week you can't see them at all because they're edge on and then they go to the other side, opening and closing. And you need to watch for a good 28 years or so to see the whole cycle. So 15 years of opening and closing on one side, 13 years of opening and closing on the other side. And I think I've been doing this long enough now to have seen the whole cycle. Um, we just got this photo recently from Lloyd Overcast just a couple days ago, 
a beautiful portrait of Jupiter and its famous red spot. So the Earth would fit inside the red spot. This uh, storm has been going on at least uh, 400 something years and it changes. We had a few years where it turned very pink and salmon where you could almost only see the outline. It lost its color. Recently it's the, regained its red color. So now's a really good time to see it. Now people sometimes look at the telescope and say, well, where is the red spot? Um, remember that Jupiter rotates once every 10 hours. So you might happen to be looking at it when the red spot's on the other side. You can get on your computer and get schedules for when the red spot will be what we call transiting, which means it's most central. So um, Lloyd made a point, it looks like the catch the red spot was very, very central. But Jupiter turns fast enough, you will notice in a few hours that that red spot is in a different spot. Um, I have a whole talk on Jupiter, which you can see online with um, just about if you want a whole hour on Jupiter, if you want to learn a lot more about it before you look at it or after you look at it, you can go to that talk. Um, in December 21st, um, we're going to have an amazing conjunction. We often have conjunctions of planets where as one passes the other, they get close, but this is the closest one since 1623. Um, we, we get thrilled when planets will actually be in the same telescope view, and this one will easily be in the same view. You'll be able to see them together in your telescope. It will not be up very long. It's much, much better place right now, but we will have a chance to see it briefly after sunset on uh, when this conjunction happens. So watch for that. You will be noticing Jupiter and Saturn gradually getting closer. So Jupiter is, is um, inside of Saturn. It's twice as almost twice as close to us as Saturn. So it's moving faster. So it's what's happening is Jupiter is overtaking Saturn. This distance is only in, on December 21st is only one tenth of one degree. And to understand what that is, when you look at the full moon in the sky and the full moon fits in most low power eyepieces, that is a half of a degree. So you can imagine that if a full moon fits inside a low power eyepiece, um, this will be easily inside a low power eyepiece and maybe inside many high power eyepieces where you can really get good views of Jupiter and Saturn together. So last chance, um, probably for a very long time, you know, they have overtake each other for 20 years, but we're not going to have this close a conjunction for a while. Now I found out that today that we are not the only ones excited about this conjunction. Apparently the astrologers are too. So you can also find out what it means for your love life. Um, now the last set of, con of constellations is my favorite story in the sky. And that whole complex is coming up in the east right now, which means it will become higher and higher in the sky. They'll be uh, easy to see the next few months. And there's an entire story. So there's several characters. Let me see what I have for the next. Okay, so some of the characters, this is just a few here. Um, you got Cassiopeia, the queen of Ethiopia. There, and then there's Cepheus, the king, and they're next to each other in the sky. They have a daughter named Andromeda, and this is Andromeda. She's like two strings of stars here, and she kind of, these strings kind of like water coming out of the great square of Pegasus. Pegasus is a flying horse on which Perseus uh, rides to rescue her because she's being sacrificed in the ocean, and the great square is considered the flying horse's wing. He does have a neck and a nose that looks very horse-like and some feet over here. Uh, the great square of Pegasus will also be easy to see because it looks fairly empty. There's not a lot of bright stars inside. So often you can see these four stars as a really obvious shape in the sky. You might try that tonight. Uh, you should be able to see that even light pollution unless it's just too low tonight. Um, so other, let me see if I have the rest of the story here. Um, oh, all right. What I was going to start here is talk about an object, which is very easy to find. It's the Andromeda galaxy. So once you identify the great square of Pegasus, you want to try to find the part closest to Cassiopeia and identify these three stars that kind of curve out and these three stars. They look, I think of those three pairs of stars that get farther and farther apart coming from this corner of the, of the, of the square. And going basically under the W of Cassiopeia. You look at the first two, and then you go to the second two, and then you go exactly that distance toward, in the direction of Cassiopeia, but in the, exactly in line. If you focus a telescope there or binoculars, you will see the Andromeda galaxy, which in a dark sky is the farthest you can see with naked eye. It's two million light years away, so it takes two million years for the light to get to us. 
Um, so here's the finder. Here's a way of finding it. Again, here's the first two stars. Now here's the second two. Don't go this far. Go one, two, three, and there's the, there's the galaxy. I was once on a cruise ship in Greece where we asked them to kind of turn off some of the lights toward the back of the ship and went stargazing. The Andromeda galaxy is actually two and a half degrees across. It's five times, the size is five times as wide as the full moon, but you don't normally, that would be from outer edge to outer edge. You normally see just the inner parts of it. I have never seen Andromeda galaxy look like a glowing naked eye pencil in the sky, except that time on that Greek cruise ship. It was astonishing. It was big, naked eye. Probably not the whole two and a half degrees, but it was an elongated glowing thing. Normally I see like a little tiny oval glowing thing um, in Texas skies. Um, this is the professional or the really good amateur astronomer equipment. This is an amateur astronomer who took this view. Um, it won't have quite this definition of small scope, but it's so big that you can't get the whole thing in the view. You might be able to look here. You might be able to put this off center and see this companion galaxy over here. It will run off the edges of even a low power eyepiece. So it's also very good in binocular, or binoculars or oversized binoculars. Um, so um, another object is called M15 over here, which is off of the nose. You just one, two, three of, um, of Pegasus. Let me see if that's the next object I have. This is one of my very favorite globular clusters in the sky as far as its shape and grace, gracefulness. Um, so I highly recommend looking at this globular cluster. Again, either a small telescope in a very dark sky. Um, you know, any dark sky, you don't need an enormous amount of power to see these. A, a five inch telescope will give you a good view, but you need the darkness. And again, this is one of those old uh, snowballs of stars. And there tend to be uh, like tens of thousands of stars in these. Um, I have discovered while doing these talks that if you do an image search and you only put something like M15, I've seen an awful lot of assault rifles when doing talks. So be sure if you want to find out more about these things, don't just put an M15, put an M15 globular cluster or M31 and galaxy. Don't, uh, otherwise you get, um, you get a whole lot of assault rifles. Uh, which I got a kick out of. Um, okay, another per character in our story of, of Andromeda and Cassiopeia and, 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 uh, and Cepheus, they're, they're her parents, is Perseus, who's a big hero. So Perseus is, um, I see Perseus as two chains of stars, one of which kind of curves gracefully and, is, and, and they point toward the left side of the W of Cassiopeia. So it's oriented this way. Andromeda is coming out this way underneath Cassiopeia. Perseus is this way. And Perseus is pretty low right now, but will become more prominent. You'll see a piece of Perseus on your map. If you can find the head of Perseus and if you find Cassiopeia, hunt around in here, not quite halfway through, but if you can find here to, and here, look in here. It's one place in the sky you can see two what we call open clusters in the same view. And I'll, I'll have that, a picture of that in a minute. Another uh, prominent thing about Perseus is, is this variable star, which is a naked eye variable star. So there are stars in the sky which change brightness, and this one changed brightness in just a few days. So people, the Greeks, ancient Greeks noticed this, and they actually named it Algol, or um, I should say, sorry, I should say many of the, of the stars are named uh, and using Arabic names. But the name means the ghoul. It's called the demon star because all the other stars seem to behave and this star very noticeably in a few days would change brightness. And we'll explain why in just a minute. Um, but back to the story though, just so you'll know why all these constellations are related. If you remember your Greek and Roman mythology, um, Cassiopeia and Cepheus were king and queen of Ethiopia. Um, they were seafaring and, and the gods sent a storm and they couldn't get their, their boats launched. And they were told to uh, sacrifice their daughter Andromeda. So she's tied to a stone um, out in the ocean. And Perseus, who has just killed the Medusa, um, and some people think this Algol, this demon star is Medusa, um, comes swooping in. Medusa's supposed to turn everybody to stone who sees it. He has Medusa in a pouch. He, re he uh, rescues Andromeda, um, but Andromeda is already betrothed to somebody else. She's promised to a, another king and he's, he tells the, the Cassiopeia he will rescue her if he gets to marry her. So they have to kind of break an engagement. Um, so he goes into their party and turns everyone to stone and 
Mary's Andromeda, and that's the story. It, but what's really cool is all these constellations are in the same part of the sky, all grouped together. So again, here's Algol, um, which was seen as Perseus holding Medusa. So there's Perseus and there's Algol. Um, Algol is what we call an eclipsing variable star. So it brightens and dims because a fainter star is going in front of it and behind it. And sometimes their brightness combines. Sometimes the star, one star dims the other. And that's what we're seeing every few days is uh, the, that's why the brightness is changing. Um, now we're gonna talk about the double cluster, which I pointed out before, which is be halfway, not halfway, almost halfway between Perseus and Cassiopeia. And this is one place in the, where you can see in a low power eyepiece about this much of it, you can get two clusters on either side. These are different from the globular clusters we saw. So these are young stars, which formed like the Gugun Nebula I showed you from the same, class, um, same cloud of gas, but the cloud of gas got all used up and the young stars are still hanging out together. We call those open clusters, there's typically 80 to 120 members. This is the only place I know where you can see two of them that are pretty big at once in one eye piece. So that's a wonderful thing. It was one of the first things I looked at, the double cluster. Um, so we talked about the story. Um, one of my favorite objects in Cassiopeia, who's also part of the story. So she's the queen of Ethiopia. Her, this, she's not really a W or M. They thought of this as her throne. She was also very vain and bragged that she was prettier than the nymphs. So her punishment was to become a circumpolar constellation and to be half in her throne and to be halfway, to be upside down half of the night as she goes around the North Star. Um, but one of my favorite objects, if you can find the main W shape in a dark sky, there's also a naked eye star over here. If you don't have a dark sky, if you go from here to here and then go about a third of that distance and slightly outside that line, you come to a star called Phi or Phi Cassiopeia. If you aim your telescope at that star, you will see an, an oh, here it is. So this is, again, to show you again, go from here to here, and there's the actual star. Just point at that star, and you get the cutest star cluster in the sky. I'm sorry, this is not the best photo of it, but this is by Cassiopeia here. He's uh, been more recently named affectionately by amateur astronomers, E.T., because it looks exactly like E.T. from the movie E.T. So there's two wide set eyes, um, there's a body, a chain of stars that goes this way, and then there's a chain of stars that goes this way for one arm, chain of stars that goes this way for two arms. Actually, when you have a small telescope, you're not going to see all this background stuff, so it's very easy to see as a stick figure. And then there's some feet. Proportion exactly like E.T. from the Steven Spielberg movie, uh, short guy with very long arms um, and wide set eyes. And I have not had anyone who's seen the movie not recognize him as a little stick figure in the sky. Now next to Cassiopeia is a house-shaped constellation, but faint, called Cepheus, one of the other circumpolar um, constellations. And another great thing to see in a small telescope is called Mu Cephei. Again, in a dark sky, you can actually see the star and just point at it. This is an amazing, enormous one, uh, uh, red star, um, one of the largest ones ever in the sky. So here's the sun, here's Mu Cephei. And it's one of the reddest things, like a ruby red star you'll see. It's worth seeing just for its color. And then finally, uh, just to round out, this is not a especially bright constellation, just want to let you know that Cetus, the sea monster, is also grouped with all these, tells, all these um, sorry, all these constellations. And that is the monster that menaces Andromeda when she's stuck out on the rock. And there's even Pisces, one of the fainter, the fish are there. So the whole, the, and Eridanus, the river. So the whole thing is out, is there. Um, and then there's finally the constellations, which you'll see along the dotted line on the southern part of your map, the, the, um, which I'll just mention briefly, constellations of the zodiac. So this time of year, we've got Aquarius, Capricornus, Sagittarius, Scorpius, which I already mentioned, Libra, and Virgo, which we're about to lose. And um, so, of course, I have a friend who does astrology and you know, sees a lot, of, says it's a good way to frame your life, but sees a lot of meaning in, in, in your life from these. But basically, it's just, they're just the constellations that the moon and the planet, I'm sorry, the sun and the planets appear to go through just from line of sight. Um, and this is a good, I, this is actually from a, just a stock photo, which I didn't buy, but I, I like the stick figures. So Aquarius, the water carrier is draw, drawn this way. 
Um, this is Sagittarius. You don't actually see the teapot's actually right here. Okay, but this is the way it's the whole Sagittarius the archer works. Um, the two fish look like two fish on a line. This is Pisces and Capricorn drawn as a goat. But what you will see is kind of a triangle chain, chain of stars. Just to let you know what those look like roughly. And there's other objects. I do want to mention Steve Goldberg, who I think is with us tonight. We, um, this is Steve's success on lighting. Um, facing the Westbury Community Garden is a small strip center with, fronted by a Valero station. And he made a major effort, finally got the owner to agree to allow them to change the white high glare lights on the back and replace them with uh, lights, which I, I, I found the lights. Um, these were only $44, which I'll show you what they look like. Um, uh, warm lights at one third of the wattage with much better visibility because we cut out the glare. So when you're out in the garden, you would see like kind of a faint building with, a, with you know, the five lights like from Star Trek when it, <laughs> Captain Picard's being tortured. I see five lights. That's what you saw. You didn't see the building. You saw five lights in your eyes. And Steve has another, it lit the entire field with white light intervening. You don't really see that in this picture because we're being glared. I have adjusted these pictures for the naked eye views, but Steve for the garden did some, the similar, the same exposures and you could see that we were using much fainter lights. But this is the way your eye sees them. Now, it's actually even better than this picture. The cam, this is my cell phone. The camera saw bright spots here. We didn't see that, that was barely there. Basically you had an even, golden soft wash of light on the on the um on here we drove here you couldn't even see the lights from the next light over and there was a the, it was amazingly even soft light over the entire uh pavement and it go, goes out about 24 feet at that mounting height so these lights would be capable of lighting an entire parking lot you wouldn't need additional pole lights with soft light and no glare and I'm hoping some other people will finally see that. So thanks, Steve, because he did all of the work with, uh, with working with this uh, company. This is what the light looks like. Um, I purposely chose one, first because it's cheap, it's only $44, but I, I like this. I'm beginning to think in the dark sky movement that we, if we could get more lights for places where it's appropriate to send the light a little bit farther out, like maybe a little bit more driveway or a little bit more parking lot, um, this light is aimed a little bit more outward, yet it's still shielded. So we found it was very low glare. Um, and what this did, it allowed more of the parking lot to be covered. And even though I knew this was going to go out into the field, I did that purposely because I'm hoping that they and the apartments next door will see that and, and choose to use those instead of, what, instead of the really bright unshielded things they're using now. And then the last thing I want to say is uh, go out and do, turn left at Orion, go out and we don't have Orion now, but go turn left at, uh, at Cygnus and start watching the sky. So that's the end of my talk. I hope I'm in time for the International Space Station if we have the clear skies. I think you are. Yeah. Thank you, Debbie. I really appreciate that. Um, great presentation as always. And uh, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and unmute your line now and, and, and ask them. We do have a few that came over on the, um, the chat here. Uh, one was about binoculars. We were able to answer that. Uh, I believe Ravi said, are you going to, will you have this uh, presentation available for people to view afterwards? Uh, the slides, I should say, not, not the presentation itself, but the slides. Is that oh. something you might be able to do, Debbie? Uh, yeah, if you can let me know how to, I mean, it, actually, I think the way to do it is I have PowerPoint online. If you can let me know the best way to get okay. it, either Dropbox or, or there may be like a link, a sharing link that sure. I Sure. I, I can help with that. And uh, Bob Gillespie said, what were the names of H.A. Ray's books? Okay, they are Find the Constellations. You do need to remember Find. Find the Constellations. And that's a skinnier one that focuses just on the constellation. And the stars, which has a little bit more information about astronomy in general, but includes all the information in Find the Constellations is within it. That's a thicker paperback book. Okay. okay. <clears throat> And then um, James McClarty asked, can you provide a link for the lights? And uh, James, we'll, I'll get that from Debbie. We can send that to everybody through AstroList tonight, if that's okay. Yes, I'll find that link. Okay. Thank you. And uh, William Turner said, could you explain Epoch again? Oh, okay. So Epoch is, um, uh, Epoch means uh, a time when the, the coordinate system, the, the Earth's 
axis is precessing. So it's actually, it's not always pointed at the North Star. So every 50 years, I mean, we're constantly changing orientation very slightly and very slowly. Every 50 mm -hmm. years, that orientation of the, north, of, of the Earth's axis has changed enough to where if you say use the coordinate system, like a star is at this right ascension and such and such declination, like latitude and longitude, it, 50 years later, it's getting far enough off that we want to redraw that coordinate system again. So an epoch is about, they, when they release a new atlas, they, they define an epoch as about 50 years where they feel like it's reasonably accurate. And then you, and then you do it again. And now apparently this, these types of changes may be made more real time with computerized star atlases. Great question. Okay. And Srikar asked, uh, thank you for the presentation. A question, how does the loaner program work, especially with current COVID climate? Appreciate if you could talk about that. That's your, for you, Joe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so so uh, for those who are new to the HAS or uh, unaware, we do have a, a loaner scope program. So if you've been a member in good standing for at least two months, we have an entire library of telescopes that you can uh, borrow from. So you can borrow those for up to two months at a time. And if uh, nobody's asking for that telescope, you can continue to borrow that telescope until such time somebody does request uh, to borrow that particular telescope. So. Um, what we've been doing and what Alan Wilkerson, our telescope chairperson, has been doing is when somebody makes a request for a telescope, he'll find a, a location for the two of you to meet that's uh, somewhat central to you both. And then maintaining as much social distance as possible, he, he'll take his telescope out of the car, uh, step back a little bit, let you uh, take control of it. And then he'll go through just briefly some of the ins and outs of the telescope itself to give you a, a little bit of a, a, you know, kind of an update on how to operate the telescope. So it's not nearly as, as you know, close one-on-one -on -one as it was before, where he could, you know, be there to show you exactly how to use the focuser, how to collimate the telescopes and things like that, but it allows us to continue the program and get telescopes in the hands of our members. So uh, be glad to answer any of, more of those questions if you'd like, if you just send me an email uh, when we're done here, joek at astronomyhouston.org. So, yep, thank you. Hey, Joe, this is Bill Spazeri. I just wanted to mention two things. Yes. I was going to bring uh, something up about the International Space Station, by the way, so yeah. go ahead. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, NASA says visible at 829 for five minutes. Uh, it's going to be 42 degrees high. It's going to appear 18 degrees up in the north-northwest, and it'll travel towards the east-southeast. And okay. the other thing I wanted to mention is that uh, on the subject of naked eye August skies, we got the Perseid meteor shower peaking, uh, I think, oh, approximately wow. August 12. Yeah, so I, you know, I was going to put in all these slides about the Perseid meteor shower. So that, right, so that's the most prominent meteor shower, I forgot to add them, uh, of, the, of the year. We will have about a 47% lit moon. Meteor showers are always best after midnight because when you the earth is basically going through um going through these particles and it works very similar to a car driving through raindrops mm -hmm. so um when, you're, when you're, your windshield gets a lot more raindrops than the, your rear window so before midnight um when you look at the sky you're kind of it's like the rear window after midnight then your part of the your part of the world is is starting to face into the meteors Unfortunately, we're about third quarter moon, and around the time we're starting to face into the meteors, we'll have some moon interference. Right. But whatever stars you can see, you'll be able to see meteors that bright. Excellent. And uh, Brian Prudhomme asked, compared to other large metropolitan areas, how bad is Houston's light pollution, and how, far should, should, how <laughs> far should I go to get away from it? So, uh, great question, and yeah, maybe he's but, just the right person to answer this. Yeah, so Houston's right. light, yeah, I mean, that's a whole nother <laughs> talk, but the white light we have so prominently in Houston is making what we call our light dome bigger and bigger. So, Columbus is probably, I understand that's still, it's been, so, I used to go when it was really, really dark. Um, it's still pretty dark. That's about it 80 is. miles away. You probably need to go that far. We have the George Observatory about an hour away, and Houston is wiping out almost half the sky at this point. So it's very good overhead and to the south. And Houston's made, I'd say, a good third of the sky virtually unusable, except for maybe a bright cluster. Uh, and it's getting worse. It's getting wider and, and brighter in that area. Absolutely. So what you want to do is go, so if you say you want to look at a certain part of the sky, try to have Houston behind you in the less desirable part of the sky. And Debbie, you're probably not exaggerating when you say it's worse than other metropolitan areas because other large metropolitan areas have uh, taken some measures 
to improve the right. glare with LED and whatnot. And Houston hasn't quite jumped aboard uh, that particular movement yet, right? Yeah, and then part of the problem is also private lighting. So what we're going to have to have with LED lighting is much wider and much brighter. Right. So we'll eventually have to have, uh, what we're going to need is lighting ordinances. A lot of city, big cities have not done that. But um, it's not just for the sky. We've had a number, I've been sending auto pedestrian accidents where there was like these white, you know, I, I'll go on Google Maps and they didn't ticket the driver and hit somebody on dark road. And a couple of times I've found there was a business with the white, their white lights were pointed like 80 degrees outward. It would have been directly in the driver's face. And at one point, the police chief actually had an, an accident investigator call me. I have that picture that Steve Goldberg and I went to the accident site and took. You can see what drivers are seeing now. Um, that particular one was a drunk driver and the accident investigator would thought I was uh, excusing him. And the, actually drunk drivers have, uh, their pupils dilate, they have twice the problems with glare. So you really don't want a drunk driver seeing what we saw at that uh, site. Probably a, a, a non-intoxicated person would be able to handle it. So it's twice as bad. Um, there's been two accidents since then where they did not ticket the driver. Um, they, were, they stayed around, they were not intoxicated and that kind of lighting was present. Plus we were asked to talk in the first board because the, the speaker uh, was near an accident like that and he said the, one, the woman driver was crying and said she couldn't see the pedestrian and he looked up and there was a bright white LED um, shining straight at the driver. So this is a major hazard, not just for the sky, but for, for us down here too. Yeah. And then other thing I was going to mention just as, as a tip, you know, when we talked about M15, M16, and those <laughs> pulling up uh, uh, Google links to, to weapons and whatnot, I've had that problem as well. You can also enter uh, Messier, M-E-S-S-I-E-R. Um, yes, Charles Messier awesome. was the French astronomer, uh, 18th century astronomer, who uh, was the first to, to catalog most of these objects in the Messier catalog that's uh, named after him. And uh, you can search for those objects there. But I've looked, you know, there's M83. I didn't know there was a, a French band named M83 <laughs> as well. So <laughs> I, and, I had that come up way, as a link as well. Yeah, if, if, if like if you're ever doing a star party, I found I often do not hold every um, every statistic in my head, like how many light years is this away. Wikipedia is great for all of these objects. Yes. They have wonderful information for each of these objects. Um, lots of details about what they are, photos, and, and definitely all the statistics you need. Absolutely. How big something is, how far away. Yeah. And uh, if I can share the screen just briefly, Debbie, if, if yes. you're okay with that. Of course. Bear with me one second. Let me know if you can see my screen. Uh, you should see uh, yes. heavens above there. So this particular website, I think, uh, Bill, you were alluding to it earlier, uh, heavens-above.com. If you haven't been to this website yet, it's a fantastic resource if you want to find out when the International Space Station may be flying overhead. Uh, you can register and get an account, or, or you can just put in your, your location, and it'll let you know when uh, certain objects, like the International Space Station, are going to be primed for a, a viewing from your location. So I've logged in here, and then down here you can see there's a, a link for 10-day predictions for satellites of special interest, and, and one of those is the ISS. If I click on this, it gives me, uh, you know, and I can change some of the settings here, but uh, just the visible settings. So for tonight, uh, 8.06, which uh, this, this was a little while, or 10.06, excuse me. So 10.06 here, uh, the ISS is going to pass uh, and, and be visible from Houston. It'll be a negative 0.9 magnitude, so fairly bright. But when you take a look over here, uh, the highest point, it's only going to be about 11 degrees. And if you're paying attention at Debbie's presentation, that's a, about a fist and a pinky, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> above the horizon. And so uh, we'll, we'll have that view here tonight. But in a couple of nights here on Saturday night, uh, there's looks like it's going to be a pretty nice viewing here. So, so to, to what Bill was saying, uh, oh, that looks like, yeah. negative 2.7 magnitude, and it'll get to about 43 degrees high. So uh, when I click on any of these date links, it'll take me to a map and it'll show the path of the object at certain times. So you can see here at uh, 828, you'll, uh, uh, the, the object will appear over the horizon, the northwest horizon. You'll see this little bit of a curvature. That's because um, you know, we're making a flat representation of what's supposed to be kind of a dome of the, of the sky above. But uh, the, the International Space Station will essentially follow this path in the night sky and then set over in the uh, which, which south, southeast 
east, uh, you know, south southeastern horizon here. So uh, that should be a pretty good viewing if you're in the Houston area um, to be able to go out and watch that. So Joe, Joe uh, go, yes, go, go back to the main page there, and on the on the right hand side and in, in the middle, there's a table. That yes, that that is a, uh, a phone app. Yes. You can download the phone app and and get the same information. Yeah. So it says it's an Android app. I'm an iOS user. So. Oh, sorry, I'm an Android. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So if you have a, an Android phone, uh, yeah, by all means. Uh, and there are other apps that will give you this kind of information. So uh, always look for those. There, there's a million things to go out and see, uh, especially with these satellites. Uh, shortly after the sun sets, you'll see lots of them if you just go outside and stare up for a few minutes. So um, Robert Gillespie also said spotthestation.nasa.gov. Absolutely. Uh, Thomas Bryan, you can get alerts about the ISS by signing up at spotthestation.nasa.gov. So yeah, we have a couple of, of uh, endorsements for that particular site from NASA. So excellent. All right, uh, I'll pause here and let people ask questions as well. So uh, we've kind of uh, hogged this question and answer time. So if you'd like to ask a question, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask away. All right, not hearing anything. So, uh, well, Debbie, again, thank you very much for the talk tonight. It was really wonderful. I know yeah. people are looking yeah. forward to uh, seeing this online. And uh, the August sky is just, for me at least, one of, one of the best times to actually go out and observe, and especially with Jupiter and Saturn being where they're at. So thank you again, Debbie, for that. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, tomorrow is going to be our general meeting. So uh, Friday, 7 p.m., uh, for more details and a register for that particular meeting, uh, go to our website, astronomyhouston.org. You'll get the Zoom registration link. You can register for the meeting there. The Zoom system will send you another email with the link to join the meeting tomorrow at 7 p.m. Uh, Bill Pellerin will be our guest speaker, and he's going to talk about the life cycle of stars, so it should be a really good presentation there. Uh, if you're into the social media thing, we're on Facebook, Houston Astronomical Society. We're actually live streaming to that right now. Uh, Twitter, at Houston Astro SOC, S-O-C and Astronomy Houston on Instagram. And if you have any questions, by all means, email us, info at astronomyhouston.org. Love to uh, help you out in any way we can. So thank you very much, everybody. And we'll see you tomorrow night. Have a great night. Mm -hmm.